Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to our very first Writers Live 2023 event. My name is Christina Wernish. I am the Adult Activities Coordinator for Palm Beach County Library System. And um, as mentioned before, this event is part of our Writers Live series, which we are now in our 15th year of doing this series. So this is a really great way to start off 2023. <laughs> Um, I would like to recognize our friends at the library. This event would not have been possible without their support. If you're currently a Friends member, thank you very much. If you are not a Friends member, we encourage you to consider joining. Your membership dues support the library services and hundreds of activities for all ages throughout Palm Beach County. And in addition to signing up, which we have a Friends table right over here. Um, we also have some flyers for our February Writers Live events if you would like to grab one of those as well. But if you sign up today for being a friend, you will uh, receive home delivered happenings magazines, opportunities to be on our library advisory board, and you will also get a bag right here with uh, the author signatures. So if you would like to do that, at the end of this, then you will you can go ahead and you can, you can sign up right over here. I would like to thank our friends over at Classic Bookshop. They are longtime supporters of our libraries as well as library events. If you would like to purchase a book and you have not today yet, we have our we have Classic Bookshop right outside in the lobby right over here. And a little bit of housekeeping, restrooms, if you need to use them, they are right through the double doors and right directly across the lobby. We have an emergency exit right over here on this side. And then this isn't an emergency exit, so the alarm won't go off. <laughs> but it does lead into the children's section if you need to go out this way as well. And we do ask you to silence your cell phones if you have not yet. And it is my pleasure to introduce our very special guests, Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child. The thrillers of Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child stand head and shoulders above their rivals, according to Publishers Weekly. Preston and Child's Relic and the Cabinet of Curiosities were chosen by readers in a national public radio poll as being among the 100 greatest thrillers ever written, and Relic was made into a number one box office hit movie. They are co-authors of the famed Pendergast series, and their recent novels include Bloodless, The Scorpion's Tale, Crooked River, Old Bones, and Verses for the Dead. In addition to his novels, Preston writes about archaeology for the New Yorker and Smithsonian magazines. Child is a, form, is a Florida resident and former book editor who has published seven novels on his own, including such bestsellers as Full Wolf Moon and Deep Storm. And without further ado, please welcome Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, we're very, very pleased to be here. This is our first tour since COVID, and uh, we really missed... Uh, getting out and meeting our readers because we love meeting our readers and hearing from them uh, when they have good things to say. If they don't have good things to say, we don't want to hear from them. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so thank you all for coming. Uh, we're really happy to see you. And uh, so, um, so we thought. We understand that um, this group particularly is a very discriminating audience and are interested in details about the books themselves and the writing process. So we're going to go into a bit more depth than we usually do. We're going to dispense with the usual shenanigans and, and tell you more about how we came to write the books um, and really how we came to write the books. And, and um, we also welcome questions on that subject uh, afterward. We'll open the floor up to questions after we talk for about 20 minutes because your questions are always more interesting than our blatherings on. Um, but anything we, we miss, um, feel free to ask. You can, <laughs> we may not answer, but feel free to ask. <laughs> afterwards. And um, we're gonna start with Doug explaining how we first met because one of the questions is, how on earth did two people even think of writing books together, let alone do it? Well, it actually started when I was working at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and I was writing a little column in the magazine. I was in my mid-twenties, and I got a call from a very distinguished-sounding editor, a senior editor at St. Martin's Press, who wondered 
if I care to have lunch with him in the Russian Tea Room, which is one of the fanciest restaurants in New York City. And I certainly did. And so I rushed down to the Salvation Army and bought a jacket so I could get into the Russian Tea Room. And when I showed up, I was looking around for this distinguished gray-haired editor that I'd spoken to on the phone. And, but instead, I saw this kid in the, who had been placed at the worst table in the restaurant in the back waving at me like this, and that was Lincoln Child. And he was a, a rising editor at St. Martin's Press, so fast rising that he already at the age of 23 he was a senior editor. And so he, he suggested I write a nonfiction book about the museum, which I did, called Dinosaurs in the Attic. And he was the editor for it. And uh, when the book was published, Lincoln started bugging me about, you know, I'd really like to see some of these weird places in the museum that you wrote about, like the Dermestid Beetle Room, where the beetles eat the flesh off the skeletons, and this and the dinosaur bone storage room. And I tried to explain to him that I, I couldn't give him a tour because I was just a lowly employee, and you know these were all you know areas that were off limits to me. But finally, we figured out a way to do it. I'm going to turn it over to Link to to describe that tour that he got. <laughs> so. Uh, thank you, Doug. Yeah, um, the reason I wanted the tour was because I was a huge fan of the uh, Museum uh, of Natural History in New York. Uh, and I, I, I was a member, and I went on all the behind-the-scenes tours, which essentially did nothing but whet your appetite, because, you know, you can see beyond the screens, you can see the pith helmet of Indiana Jones hanging up, you know, uh, while he's working on whatever he stole for, on his latest foray. And, and it, it doesn't really show you everything you want to see. And, and here I found somebody to write a book about the museum for me as an editor. You know, editors have to find product, um, or like a shark, or I'll say die, or in my case, would get fired. So, you know, I have someone who knew the whole thing, and I, I said, as part of this thing, you know, Doug, that now that I've made your career, you have to take give me an interview, I mean, a, a tour. And he didn't want to go, for obvious reasons, it would get him in trouble. Um, but finally he agreed, but he said, okay, it has to be in, at midnight, you know, because nobody's around, you know, and the security guards tend to just watch TV around that time um, after they've made their rounds. So this was, what, 30 years ago, 40, 50, it was, it was a while ago. But it was before security, the it is now. And so he managed to get his hands on a key and uh, got us in. And what I saw this on this tour blew my mind. Um, he mentioned the domestic beetle room. Uh, the domestic beetles are these flesh-eating beetles that if you have a, a giant sloth or a tapir or your ex-spouse, perhaps, you know, and you need to have the, the corpse cleaned. You dr throw it in the tank, and these beetles will eat all the flesh off, and they have a nice articulated skeleton for mounting or uh, displaying. Um, and if you leave it in too long, they eat the bones, too, so you have to monitor how long it's in there. And then I, he showed me the uh, dinosaur bone storage room, which has to be in the basement because the weight of the bones is so heavy that it'll collapse the floor if it's any place higher than that. And we ended up, I mean, it's, I tell it to you, but it's, it was like a movie set. You know, we ended up on the fourth floor um, in the Hall of Cretaceous Dinosaurs, as it was called then. And there was a thunderstorm outside, and I could see lightning flashing through the clerestory windows overhead illuminating the mandible of the T-Rex that was looming over us, you know, and, and I, I turned to Doug, who had recently submitted a, uh, now that he's finished his nonfiction, he submitted a mystery to me, a proposal for a mystery novel, and it, it was not good at all. But, um, <laughs> but this, this, this guy rejected it, can you believe it? It's not a good beginning to our partnership. <laughs> Yeah, he keeps saying that, and I threatened to put it up on the web one of these days, so everybody else can see what it looked like. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I turned to him and I said, Doug, you know what? This building is the scariest building in the world, you know. I think we should write a techno thriller <coughs> here. And 
Back then, technothrillers existed of Jurassic Park, and that was it. You know, they, it wasn't a genre. And Doug looked at me with, like, you know, interest kindling in his eyes. And then a guard walked in. And I'll let Doug finish the story. Well, that was, uh, what happened was that the, the room, the, this huge dinosaur hall was very dark. All the lights had been turned out, except for the emergency fluorescent lights in the ceiling. So I was like these crazy shadows, and we were in shadow. Here's this guard in the doorway, framed, you know, with a yellow light behind him. And he's yelling, he's got a big flash, and he says, who's, it? who's there? Who's that talking? Who's there? He was terrified. <laughs> you know, he'd been doing his rounds for 10 years, and all of a sudden there are people there. And I thought, oh my God, I'm in trouble now. They're going to find out I'm an employee. I'm going to get fired. Oh, geez, this is terrible. But Link said, Doug, let me handle this. Right? Well, I didn't know what he was going to do, but I thought, I don't want to handle it. So Link, so this guard said, who is that? Who is that? And Link said, oh, thank God. Thank God you found us. Oh, my God, how do we get out of this place? <laughs> And the guard said, what do you mean? It's uh, 1 o'clock in the morning. The museum closed at 5. And Link said, don't we know it? Oh, my God. We've been walking around here for hours. We can't find our way out. This is a crazy museum. And the, oh, the guard was completely taken in. And he said, oh, he said, I, I, uh, I, he said, I'll show you the way out. And he never took our names or looked past our ID. And he brought us out to security. And I... At that point, I realized, you know, this guy's going to make a good partner. <laughs> He's going to get me out of trouble. Uh, and and he, he actually has, uh, well, you know, he, he, you know I'm, I'm a person, I'm a somewhat impulsive person, and I get myself into trouble, and Lincoln has, has rescued me at times, although he's never had to bail me out, but you know, close. We'll get, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a minute, the bailing out, but... Um, that only really covers how we met. Um, the other question that we get asked even more frequently is how the hell do two people write a novel together? Um, and I will tell you that when we first began, no, no publisher knew the answer to that, and the question was something they didn't really want to approach because I remember there, there was a novel called The Laughing Policeman at the time, written by two, I think, Scandinavians. But other than that, I didn't know of any novels, especially contemporary, you know, um, popular novels that, you know, you hope are going to sell a lot of copies. And so, um, as it turned out, when we, we finally made it, in England we were published as Lincoln Preston for many years until we forced them to... Uh, you know, do the right thing and um, call us by our real names. But anyway, um, once we wrote Relic, um, it took us a year and a half. Well, we wrote it in three years because it was a, a lark. You know, I've worked in publishing as an editor for almost 10 years, and every editor had the perfect novel under their bed. <coughs> They'd read so much fiction that they thought they, they knew they could slot in you know, you know, ten fights here and a sex scene here, and then a, you know, a car chase down here, and, and it will sell, be the great American novel. But of course, it wouldn't, you know, because you can't write a book cynically. You know, readers are too intelligent for that. Um, so I knew how difficult it was going to be, um, but I thought that I had a, I had a leg up because I was a publisher. I I knew agents, but even so, we got turned down, you know, I mean, it took us three years to write it, and then it took us a year and a half to find, well, we found an agent eventually, but then it took him two years almost to land it, so it's, it's a difficult process. And at that point, we actually had to start writing more books because they had accepted Relic. Um, and the process has changed over the years, but, um, it began with me being the editor, writing many of the uh, outlines of the chapters, and Doug writing uh, the actual chapters, which which I would then edit, and it would make him very annoyed. You know, so he'd undo all my edits, and um, 
Since then, we've made an agreement not to use document compare um, so that we can't see what each other does. Um, and then eventually, you know, uh, it morphed into us working more or less 50 50. That's how we do it today. And it isn't that Doug takes chapter one and I take chapter two because that, that would be a recipe for failure. You know, if I wanted the, the prince to, to live and he had a great idea for a, a death scene with a skull, you know, um, you know, it, it would be a, a mess. So what we do is we tend to take subplots or certain characters or certain kinds of chapters. Doug's very good at the action chapters, you know, um, and and uh, then we'll get together to the next set of ten chapters of the book we're working on. So we have a, an idea of where we're going. We don't want to hammer it in too closely. Um, we want to give ourselves room to be organic. And then we assign the chapters, and we write them, and then we both pass it back and forth, and that's when we both get mad. And, um, um, but uh, the thing that's really interesting is that Doug likes to call it our Shakespearean prose, you know, and the other person doctors it and messes it up, right? Um, but uh, then we, we put a Zamboni over the whole thing, and so at the end of the day, ideally, nobody knows who wrote what because we put all four hands on, you know, every sentence, basically. Um, and, uh, but we do fight a lot. And also we've written solo novels, so we know actually how valuable it is to have a partner. Um, because otherwise, writing's a very lonely business and often you get to a point and you, you're not sure which way to go. And, you know, he can call me or I can call him, we can brainstorm to the fat, figure it out. And we can't really do that on our own books. And the other thing that I can't do is some of the research because Doug has, either he's just crazy or sociopathic or he's just dumb, I'm not quite sure what it is. But he will, he, he gets helicoptered into the Panamanian, a Honduran rainforest you know, where if the helicopter crashed, he'd be toast because the canopy is so thick, no one would ever find him. You know, and that's where his book, The Lost City of the Monkey God, came from, uh, which is a, a great read. I recommend it to any of you. Um, and on our own books, too, it happens. And it happened in the case particularly, most recently, speaking of being bailed out, in a book of ours called Gideon's Sword, which was the first book in a new series. We decided to branch out, and we had an idea for a, a scene, which Doug will tell you about. Well, well there's, a, there's an island in uh, Long Island Sound called Heart Island, and it's the largest potter's field in the world. It's something like three million people are buried there. And these are, from 1865 on, these are all the indigent uh, people who die in New York City and whose bodies are unclaimed, and so they get buried in Hart Island. And the bodies now, now are buried by inmates from Rikers Island Prison. You know, these are murderers and people like that. Uh, and no one lives on Hart Island, and there are huge signs all around that say, you know, do not land, warning, New York City Department of Corrections, Doug, aren't there like a ton of old buildings there yeah, from like sanitariums or something? Yeah, there, there are all, all these old buildings from the days when it was a yellow fever a sanitarium. There are, old, there are old Nike missile bases on this island. I mean, there's just all kinds of weird stuff. A whole village on this island. And uh, so we thought, well, this would make an incredible setting for uh, this novel, Gideon's Sword. And we had this idea that these that there was a body that was buried there and they had to recover, or a piece of a body that was buried that had something in it. They had to recover this surreptitiously so they sneak on the island and they and there's a there's a fight with backhoes and all the rest of it. I mean, I don't know if you've read Gideon's Sword, but you so you know all about that. So I thought, because it's very important in our books that we really 
know what we're writing about. I mean, we just don't make stuff up. This is, we go there, we you know, go to the settings, we do the research. So I thought, oh, it'd be fun to make a gorilla landing on Hart Island and explore it. I proposed this to Lincoln, and he was like, are you crazy? Yeah, no way am I gonna do that. That's completely fun, nuts. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but I have a very intrepid wife who's a photographer, and she said, I'll go with you. So we went to City Island in the Bronx, and we rented a little boat. We told them we were going fishing. We went out in Long Island Sound, crossed over to Hart Island, landed on this little beach, um, and we're walking around. My wife was taking all these pictures, and we heard this noise, and we went to hide, but we weren't quick enough. And here comes this bus uh, around this corner, and the filled with, with murderers who were gonna bury the bodies and corrections officers and they saw us and they stopped the bus and they jumped off with their guns drawn and they were looking around for us and I said to Christine, listen, we better surrender before they have to find us. So we came up with our hands up and they're pointing the guns at us, what are you doing here? Who are you? What's going on? And, you know, so and we're gonna order, you're gonna be arrested. And didn't you see the signs? And we were like, oh, what, what signs? <laughs> Those signs right there, the biggest, you know, these signs that are like five times the size of a, a billboard on the highway. <laughs> you know, with, with letters that are literally 10 feet tall. And uh, well, they, so they called the supervisor and he came down. And he was a lot calmer than these guys. He was like, okay, okay, let's all calm down here. And meanwhile, these murderers are hanging out the windows of the bus and and you know, making cat calls, and they're all having a wonderful time. And there, there are other you know, agents there who are using the most terrible four-letter language, yelling at them, get back on the bus, you oh, It was really something. So the supervisor, we, I finally talked him out of arresting us. I showed him my New Mexico driver's license. I'm just an ignorant tourist from New Mexico. We, we, don't, we didn't know, and so he finally relented. But he said, I want you to delete all those pictures. I want to see you delete those pictures, said my wife. So she went through deleting every picture. I was, like, I was heartbroken. These were great photographs. So then we got back in the boat and we're out in the water, crossing the water. And I said, I'm so sorry you deleted those pictures. And she said, I didn't delete any pictures. Hell no. Should I just... You know, I just looked like I was deleting them. I was just paging through them. <laughs> I didn't know anything about a digital camera. <laughs> so, those pictures still exist, and you can find them on our website. And in fact, she was even taking pictures while she was pretending to delete them. She was taking pictures of these big, beefy guys with their guns and everything, and like big, you know, backs and everything, you know, taking pictures of them from weird angles. I couldn't believe it. Anyway. So, when you read Gideon's Sword, that's, uh, um, those scenes in there are really based on real life. I was going to tell the end of that story. Well, why don't you tell how we, uh, how we invented where Pendergast came from? Yes. As a yes. I bet they'd like yes. to hear that. Before I begin, I, uh, we, we, we mean no disrespect to um, any people with, um, with greater or lesser melanin. Uh, um, is that a good way to say it? I guess so. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So, um, uh, these days you have to be very careful, you know what you're saying. Um, so anyway, um, this was back in the early, early days of us writing together. It was our very first book, in fact, and I was still writing the outlines for Doug. And so I've written out the, the opening chapter outlines where a body is, you know, someone is killed, then the body is found, and then the body is, is investigated. And Doug wrote these chapters, and they were perfectly good chapters. Um, Except that the two cops were were classic stereotypes of New York City cops. You know, either they were both Italian or they were both Irish or they were O'Shaughnessy and and you know. Um, Di Agosta. Yeah, Di Agosta. I was I was only Giuliani, but I thought no. <laughs> um, and uh, 
and I said to Doug, these, these are great chapters, but um, you know, I think these two characters are like, they blend together, you know, there's nothing different about them, and they're just, they're very shallow, and uh, you know, uh, too quickly drawn, and really uh, sort of ephemeral, and just not very good. And I went on in this vein for quite a while, um, about how these characters were just forgettable and, and archetypes and, and stereotypes and everything of other kind of type and how he should combine them into one and then create another character very different than those two. And by this time he was really mad and, and offended and so he said sarcastically, like what, like an albino from New Orleans or something? <laughs> Hence my apologies. <laughs> and, um, and I said, well, you know what? Don't dismiss that too fast. I think maybe we can work with that. And, uh, and that was the germ of Pendergast. He's not albino. I mean, he could be. Um, he just is very pale, uh, has blonde white hair. And the moment he came on the scene, maybe Doug was still angry at me, but he had him saying things that a, a fed or a cop wouldn't normally say. You know, he was likening the bloodstains on the wall to a Jackson Pollock painting, you know, and uh, and being kind of a smart ass. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and we were having fun with him. And when I read this, I loved it. And so then I added my own stuff to it and immediately, uh, like Tinkerbell waving all her wand, or Athena from the forehead of Zeus, Pendergast was, was born. And um, the last thing I want to say before we turn it over to questions is that um, uh, there's some background of the book sitting in front of you, just a few words. Um, after we wrote Relic and its sequel, we kind of went on to other books of adventure, like Riptide about Oak Island treasure and Thunderhead and other other things and we just we found ourselves spinning our wheels a bit in terms of progressing as authors and it was kind of depressing and I don't know who it was but somehow we thought of going back to the museum again and bringing in Agent Pendergast again and having a serial killer 150 years ago who was trying to prolong his life by killing people and making an elixir and now it seems like people are, there's a copycat killer or is it a copycat killer? Did he succeed? You know, and so that was the cabinet of curiosities um, where half of our Pendergast, you know, backstory started feedback, you know, we're, we're hearing buzz about this book, it's really good. <laughs> And so we, we thought, why didn't we think of this earlier? Um, and then 10, 15 Pendergast books go by and we realize, why didn't we think of the other part of the story earlier? You know, he's dealt, Pendergast has dealt with his brother. He's dealt with, uh, you know, other relatives. He, um, he's done everything he has to do is his son, you know, uh, um, what about his great uncle, you know, this evil Dr. Lang, you know? And so now, finally, um, in this book, things come full circle, and we realized his greatest enemy and his greatest challenge was his own ancestor, who may or may not be alive in the present, but who he has access to, on, you know, in, in a plausible way. And, and that's how we came to write this book um, in particular. Um, and we were proud of all our, our babies, but we're particularly proud of this one because there was a lot of research involved. So unless Doug has anything to add, I just want to thank you very much for your attention and we'd be delighted to answer any questions you might have about our books or our writing process or anything along those lines. Yes, uh, do, so does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have a Yes. How did you come up with these stories? The first book of yours that I had read was The Cabinet of Curiosities, 
And after I read that, I was really hooked on your story. And I'm curious <coughs> how you come up with the stories. They were frightening to me. And I lived in New York. I'm familiar with the new scene, but of course, I don't know what's underneath it. And I was just fascinated as to how you come up with the stories that you do. Well, that, that particular book, we had the idea for of it years before we actually figured out how it was going to turn into a story. So we, we thought it'd be really cool that there's a serial killer who was operating in the 19th century in New York City, disposing of his victims, walling them up in this old coal tunnel, who was never caught. He was like the Jack the Ripper of New York City, but he was never caught. In fact, no one knew that he even was operating because the people he was killing had never were missed. So the first scene was this construction of this, you know, base of this, uh, you know, hole for a huge building in New York City, and they they come across this coal tunnel, and they find these 36 walled up bodies that have been mutilated, of young women murdered uh, 140 years ago in New York City. But then we thought, where does where's the story going to go from here? And it took us years. It was like two or three years before we, we came up with, with the rest of the story. So there's a huge gap between idea and plot. And like a lot of beginning writers think, oh, I've got a great idea. And what they don't realize is that that's only 5% of the work, and the other 95% is turning that idea into a plot. And how do we get our ideas to finish Question. Yeah, I don't know. Do you want no, to answer that? Just go ahead. <laughs> You're working that. well. You're working well. Um, oh, I wish I could tell you. I mean, it's a weird thing. Those ideas, I don't know where they come from. They, they, we argue. We talk. We have these. Well, some of the ideas come from nonfiction stories. Like, for example, Riptide uh, came from a story that I wrote for Smithsonian about the real Oak Island treasure in Nova Scotia. Um, Thunderhead came from a story I wrote in the New Yorker about Anasazi cannibalism in the prehistoric Southwest. And we're now writing a novel called D Dead Mountain, which will be published in August, which was based on a story I wrote in the New Yorker about those nine skiers who disappeared in the Ural Mountains mm -hmm. in 1959 in the Soviet Union. I don't know, did, did anyone read that article in the New Yorker? Anyway, so we thought that we could turn that into a fictional story. We're, we do what Shakespeare did with Hollingshead, who's, who wrote all of the history of England or whatever, all those histories. He just, he just took the, those real histories, and a lot of his plays were based on uh, real, real history that he would then fictionalize. I would know that it was Doug who compared us to Shakespeare, not me. <laughs> More other questions, please? Yes. What prompted you to um, kill him off in cemetery dance? Did everybody hear the question? No. no. Um, she would. She the the lady wanted to know why we killed off one of our major characters from the early books, Bill Smith back. And the reason is, um, well, I'll tell you the truth. Um, uh, for one thing, Bill Smith back. We put a lot of ourselves in him. You know, we gave him some of our our favorite jokes, and you know, you know, we kind of saw ourselves as him in a way. And yeah, we gave him some of our worst qualities, yeah, as well as our best. Um, and people at book signing started to say, you know, why don't you get some new characters in? Give it that Bill Smith back. He's such a windbag, you know. So we, we couldn't help but be offended by that, you know. And, and we considered, and so Doug was always after me about, we have to kill off a really important character. You know, what if we kill off Pendergast? And I'd say, no, no, what are you thinking? Um, and so then we, we, um, we you know, lurked, is that the term, on the bulletin board, and pretended to say, what if, what if Barbara Green dies? He's the heroine of the first book. And that got such a murderous response, we decided we couldn't do that. But we thought that Bill Smithback, maybe he's outlived his usefulness to us, you know? I mean, he's 
The poor guy's been operated around without an anesthetic. He's been locked up. He's been paced. You know, he's um, as he's, he's had food dropped on his chest by his wife. You know, at a cocktail party, and um, so we thought we'll get rid of him just to show our readers that no character is safe, and just because you know, I mean, obviously you all know as readers that you think that certain people are going to make it to the end. Um, and to make sure that, that, and Doug said, to make sure that people know that, let's show the autopsy, you know. Um, <laughs> so, so we do show the autopsy. Um, and we now have second thoughts about it um, because we did love him as a character and we did identify with him and people, uh, you know, they guilt us about having done it. But on the other hand, we don't regret it because, you know, I mean, these books mean a whole lot to us and, and we're, not, we're not just phoning them in, you know, we, we struggle all the time and fight all the time. It's what we like to do it. If we weren't writing, we probably would be digging ditches or something because, you know, um, it's such an enjoyable craft. And so it was important to us that people knew that you know, were invested in the story as much as we were. And still it hurt, it hurt. And so that's why Roger Smithback, his brother, has reappeared in some recent <laughs> books, um, who's also a reporter. And if we ever really need a Smithback-like character, he can uh, fill in for him. But that's a, it's a very good question, and that's, 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 the, real, that's the real answer. Yeah. Yes, Miss. I have two questions for you. I've never read any of your books. Which books should I start with? <laughs> well, I, I think the one we were just talking about, Cabinet of Curiosities, is that, would, would you all agree with that? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. yeah, that's just definitely the one you should start with. And that one actually leads into this one. So uh, there are a whole bunch of books in between, but, but the Cabinet, you, you can then read this one after Cabinet. Thank you. And my second question is, if New York City wants to put a statue in front of the Museum of Natural History, what should that statue look like that would show the Museum of Natural History that we visit today? Yeah, because they took down Teddy Roosevelt. You know, he, there was a statue in front of Teddy right. Roosevelt on his horse with, with an Indian and a black standing next to him. And, yeah, they didn't like that. So they took that down. So what kind of statue? This is a really interesting question. Um, and I think about. that a statue of myself would be uh, <laughs> very fitting, since I've immortalized it with the help of Doug. Or maybe he could be in it too, in a, yeah. in a slightly, you know, inferior position. Yeah, he'll be on the horse and I'll be down there. To, you know. um, yeah, I, I think a, a statue of, of a non-human, maybe a paramecium or a, a amoeba. <laughs> I don't know. A trial of bite. A trial of <coughs> Or a, t a T Rex. That would be fun. So, yes. Yes. Is Gideon Crew dead and gone? No. He is uh, rocking in his chair in his cabin in the Hamas Mountains, looking at that, a gemstone in his hand. And Waiting for Hollywood to call. <laughs> We don't know what his current state status is of his health, but he's, we have not heard of his passing yet. Do you like, do you like Gideon Crew? Very much. People like those books? Yes. Yeah, well, okay. he might come back. Who knows? All right, well, that, thank you for telling us that, because we, we really haven't asked that question before, and, you know, um, that was a sort of a, we wanted to write a different kind of a character, write a fast-moving, you know, not quite so outre book, you know, with characters that you can follow and a lot of action. And and we like Gideon, but um, we we just weren't sure always how our, how our readers felt about him. So thank you for that feedback. Uh, any, any, any other questions? Yes, sir. My favorite book is The Still Life of Crows. Um, oh. And I'm curious if, uh, was it Corey? Swanson, is she based on anybody that you all knew? Or because like it seems like Pendergast like 
helped her out where he doesn't usually do that. Did you, the question was, um, in Still Life with Crows, which is this gentleman's favorite book of ours, um, was the character of Corey, the young heroine, based on anybody? Well, the, uh, she wasn't really based on anybody in particular. But at the time I was writing that book, my oldest daughter was uh, 16 or 17. And, you know, I was not sure that we would really be able to pull off the writing realistically the character of like a rebellious 18-year-old goth. So I asked my daughter, I said, well, what, what kind of clothes would she wear? And what, 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 would, it, what would they look like? And, and she, my daughter, Celine, was so excited by this assignment. She, she cut a playlist for me so we could hear the music she'd listen to. She, she had pictures of what kind of clothes she'd wear, the books she'd be reading, uh, her expressions, her sarcasm. I mean, that was, it was great. So she really helped a lot in helping us bring that character to life. Uh, I'm kind of, sorry. I'm kind of curious why you like Still Life with Crows. To me, it was one of the spookier books because it's underground. Somebody's killing people in the silo, and he's got a teenage. He's relying on a teenage kid who may or may not work at Hot Topic to help him find this the killer. And to me, it was like the one I could not put down. Like I stayed up all night, like reading it. And then I had my like mom, dad, my brothers, like you got to read it. Well, thank, you, thank you. I'm, I'm curious. How many of you have read The Still Life with Crows? Wow, okay. Wow, so everybody, and pretty much, how about Cabinet of Curiosities? Which is your favorite? Cabinet? Cabinet. Or I still like with crows? Cabinet. I still like your answer, but I, 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 wanted, to, I wanted to riff off that for a minute. Um, I, I spent many years under protest growing up in a small town of Minnesota, surrounded by corn, you know, and um, I, I was born uh, on the coast of Connecticut, and being landlocked with so much corn, corn and, and you know, soybeans and all this stuff around, it really felt claustrophobic in a funny way. And so we decided, I drew on that memory and that sort of un uncomfortable feeling when we decided to write a book where we were going to place Pendergast totally out of his element. You know, there's not a Dina to look for a thousand miles, you know, um, and see how he reacted. And um, so I thought, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll set it in Kansas, you know, because there's, there's corns everywhere, and it's like the center of, the, of nowhere. I mean, no, no, no disrespect to Kansas. I mean, I know we're being filmed. Um, but I've taken trains through there, and there's a pretty bleak, um, remote areas and corn, you know, I thought, and then we had the killer could rustle through the corn, you know, um, and it was only later on that we were told that Kansas grows wheat, not corn. <laughs> <laughs> Artistic <laughs> license. Uh, yes. Um, we both write and love to write. She's published, I'm not, but I'm fine. Sometimes the story takes me where I need to go. Mm -hmm. Like when we're talking about killing all Bill Smith back. Some it characters all, take over. Yeah. Uh, the question is, um, from a writer and a published writer, um, do our characters take <coughs> over our stories? And the answer is most definitely. Often, unexpectedly. You know, it's not like we say, we'll write a couple of chapters and then let 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 you know give, give the horse his own his head you know um, they will drag us in places you know for example we had no idea that this book would have a sequel to it which it does you know um, we like to we don't like to leave people and you know hanging um, but it went in a, a direction we didn't we never saw coming and that happened with brimstone and that has happened with some of the books involving Constance because she's, you know, very unpredictable. Um, so yes, definitely. Is I think I think, and we'll see if Doug agrees with me. It's a good sign when the characters take over because if we have one bit of advice to aspiring writers, it's write about what you enjoy. You know, write about what you know about or something about. Write a story you would like to read yourself. 
um, don't write what you think will sell a lot of copies because you don't know. None of us know. You know, it's always, I mean, look who's on the list right now. It's, um, uh, you can never guess. So make it a project you enjoy. And then with, with any luck, they will, they'll run away with the story themselves. That's a good sign. Well, we, th that's a real sore point because um, we, uh, you know, when Paramount Pictures made The Relic 27 years ago, and uh, they cut Pendergast from the movie, but they've retained rights to his character, and they will not, they've, they've already told our agents they have no interest in ever producing a movie or television series with Pendergast, and based on that, we went out and they went out and got a wonderful million dollar offer to do a television series on, on Pendergast from a really great uh, Warner production company that did, does a lot of HBO shows. And uh, then Paramount wrote a really nasty legal letter and said, no, we, even though we're not ever gonna make them do anything with Pendergast, nobody else is either. Oh, and, oh, uh, shame. Yeah. So we're very upset by that. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to work things out with Paramount, but they're they are not nice people. That's all I can say. Well, we live in hope. Uh, we have we have time for two more questions. Yes. Now, someone just told me that Cabinet of Curiosities is now a Netflix series. Is that true? It's not the same. It's not that was uh, Guillermo del Toro, yeah. Yeah. and he just took the name. It has uh, nothing to do with our books or anything okay. like that. Yeah. One more question? Anybody? Yes. Could you talk about the evolution of Constance as a character and where she's going, <laughs> where she has been? All right. Um, Constance's question is what, where Constance Green kind of came from and where is she going? Um, it was after we finished the cabinet. I'll, I'll try and keep this short. Um, it was after we finished the Cabinet of Curiosities that one of the fans on our bulletin board said, you know, it's too bad that he didn't, I don't remember exactly the details because it wasn't quite the way I'm describing it, it was different. But wouldn't it be smart if, if Lang had kept somebody else alive all those years and was helping him? And I thought, that's a great idea, you know. Um, but the book was already published. You know, and so we were writing Still Life with Crows, which came afterwards, but there were still some chapters set back in um, New York. And so we began with Constance, you know, she's, Constance has been living in that place ever since Lang took her in. Um, and she didn't know anything about the outside world because he, you know, Stockholm Syndrome to her or whatever, and, uh, so when he's killed, um, I'm giving away a ton of stuff here, sorry. <laughs> you asked the question. Um, um, she's terrified and she knows the basement of the mansion very well. And so slowly she comes out and she becomes Pendergast's um, assistant, you know, a, a woman Friday, a savior, you know, um, harpsichord player. But she's not right in the head, as you would as you would not be surprised to hear after that, that kind of a life. Um, but I realized we we couldn't just leave it of her showing up suddenly, you know, with no no mention in cabinet of curiosities. So we put in one sentence in the paperback, where in the end part end of the book, when Pendergast is searching the basement for Lang who he thinks is Lang. Um, he goes past a, uh, a, a corridor and this pair of eyes follows him, you know, from behind a curtain. And we thought, okay, now we've dotted that eye and no one's gonna notice it. And if we get questioned about it, we can point back to that being her. She was in the book. 
And as soon as the paperback came out, we got like 10,000 emails. What is that pair of eyes doing there? And who was that? So, it, you know, it shows you that you can't fool anybody, especially press and child readers. But where is she going? Um, to answer your question, she's leading us. You know, we don't know. But um, she, she is front and center there, and she's front and center in the next book which we are working on and are doing. We are getting all the way down from St. Augustine about what's going to happen in the next book with her. But uh, we guarantee you um, we'll give it our best shot and that we think you will like it. We hope you will like it. And we're so glad you came out and we'll be happy to sign your books. And thank you, thank you for being our readers and for enjoying uh, our books and for being interested in them because without you, we would not be here. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you.